morning. I'm really thankful for Christian education. This weekend, uh, this week actually, we had two grandsons graduating, one from the public school system and one from Christian Academy. And uh, what a contrast. You know, it's good to hear our young people say praises and give thanksgivings, thankful messages to their parents in the Christian school and uh, dress, uh, dress up with a tie for the first time, it seems like some of them. And in the uh, public school, which I'm familiar with because I attended public school for a few years, after the graduation, you go off to a barbecue and a dance. <laughs> Quite a difference between Christian education and what the public school system has to offer. Uh, this morning, we're going to uh, talk about heavenly treasure. Ever, anyone ever been on a treasure hunt? It can be kind of fun. It also be kind of frustrating if you, you know, didn't find anything. And it's even more frustrating if nobody found anything in the treasure hunt. I want to tell you a true story about a treasure hunt uh, by a gentleman by the name of Forrest Fenn. Uh, he was a New Mexico art collector. And he created a treasure hunt, being a wealthy man. Back in 2009, uh, he was retired. He had this collection of antiques. And he claimed that he had a treasure that was worth about $2 million. Finn published a book with a poem contain, containing clues to the exact location of this treasure. So over the next decade, thousands of amateur sleuths joined an increasingly chaotic chase, which led to dozens of rescues, some by helicopter, in five known deaths in search of this treasure. Yes, true story. So Forrest, he put together this collection. And in this bronze chest, he took pictures before he went out into the Rocky Mountains. He took pictures of this treasure to prove that it was a real treasure. It was worth hunting for. And this chest was buried that he buried in the mountains, was filled with gold nuggets, coins, sapphires, diamonds, gems, pre-Columbian artifacts, and some other valuable items. For those seeking adventure and gold, guess what? Crack his poem and then head to the mountains. He was an art dealer, Finn was, and a millionaire. So in his 80s, he published a memoir. He included a poem in there that supposedly would lead to the treasure that he had hidden in the mountains. So we go off to the beautiful Rocky Mountains, and they span a few states in the United States. As many as 3,500 people search for this treasure unsuccessfully. The poem is said to have only contained nine clues to guide them to the treasure. But as time elapsed and the treasure wasn't being found and he was advancing in years, you could go to his website or his blog and gain a few more clues, which eventually led to the treasure being found. So here's a map. Um, he said in this poem, the instructions were, it was from Can Canada southward as far as New Mexico, spanning through Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and of course, New Mexico. So the search was on, and many a uh, adventurer sought for the clues that would lead to the treasure. Once, it was at a point in the search that an Illinois man was looking for the buried treasure when he fell to his death in Yellowstone National Park. Here you see bison grazing just inside the park near Gardner, Montana in 2011. This 50 three-year-old man named Jeff 
was hiking in Yellowstone National Park when he disappeared. Park investigators found his body June 9th, where he had fallen 500 feet from Turkey Pin Peak after accidentally stepping into a chute. Not good. But he wasn't just on a day hike. He was looking for a treasure box with gold and jewels worth a lot of money. It's buried somewhere in the Rocky Mountains by that eccentric millionaire named Forrest Fenn. The box was just 10 inches by 10 inches, weighing 40 pounds. And later, Fenn said that, look, you're hunting for something in a very dangerous place. You shouldn't be doing that. When I put the box in the mountains, I was 80 years old and I had to make two trips. That means 20 pounds each time. I made two trips from my car to the location where I hid the treasure chest. So don't do something really extreme and difficult. It's at an elevation above 5,000 feet, which is not hard to do in the Rockies. He gave additional clues. It's not in a mine, it's not in a graveyard, and it's not near a structure. Well, Murphy, the one who died, he was the fourth one to die while searching for the chest. But the investigation showed that Murphy was not just on a day hike because there was email correspondence between him and Forrest Fenn in the days just before his death. Emails were also found by Murphy searching for the treasure between him and the forest ranger. So it was confirmed. And Forrest Fenn was so concerned for the man's well-being, he offered to pay for a helicopter, search and rescue helicopter, to go out and look for this treasure hunter. Fenn also wrote that he had never been to that area where Murphy had fallen. Other reports included headings like another fatality in the mountains. As the wife, Linda, of her former husband who died says, this hunt is ludicrous. It should be stopped. Well, who's going to end it? Only after the treasure is found, right? And so after that 52-year-old man had died, Finn posted additional clues on the treasure seeker's blog in hopes of preventing more injuries and more deaths. He says, the treasure chest is not underwater. It's not near the Rio Grande River. It's not necessary to move large rocks or climb up or down steep precipices. It's not under any man-made object. He was 80 when he hit the treasure and he reminded the seekers that he had to make two trips because he was an old man from his car to the place where he placed the treasure. He added in conclusion, he says, please be cautious and don't take unnecessary risks. The search for treasure is supposed to be fun. He said, I, I hid the treasure but it's not really that hard to find. So the seekers traverse through the five states and one by one is noted on the far left, those who died during their quest for wealth. In June 8th of 2020, and later an update article in September of the same year, the New York Times and other news agencies said, hey, the chase is over. The, the chase for that hidden treasure in the Rocky Mountains has come to an end because the treasure has been found. Or Sven confirmed it. He says, yes, 
the finder of the treasure has sent me a picture and the location. <clears throat> and it's verified the treasure has been found. But the finder of the treasure wishes to be kept anonymous. Seeking for treasure. What a person won't do to find something of real value, including risk their life to the point of <clears throat> even risking life itself. Where was the treasure hidden? According to Mr. Finn, quote, he says, it was under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. And it had not been moved from the spot where I hid it more than 10 years ago. Now, then 89 said this on his website, but he did not elaborate on the exact location for concerns that many would flock to the site. What does it take to find heavenly treasure? which surely has a lot more value than any earthly treasure. And you don't have to lose your life. Well, you might lose that. Yeah, it does talk about death in the, in the New Testament, doesn't it? That man being crucified, that old man being crucified. So there is a death involved in finding heavenly treasure. Crucifixion of self. The kingdom of heaven is like, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but let's go back to the scripture that was read earlier. Lay up treasures in heaven. In Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for your treasures, yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> this is part two of a message. I'm going to go to Matthew 24 now. In 24:35, Jesus said this about heaven and earth. What? They will pass away. They might pass away. I don't think heaven's going to pass away, is it? But he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my what? My words will not pass away. So this morning, we're here to study his words. Why? Because they're more valuable than anything. Shouldn't we be spending more time studying his word? Absolutely. It's the greatest treasure of all, Christ's words. So in uh, <clears throat> Matthew 13, Jesus used the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. How many times? About eight times. Jesus was speaking to a multitude of people. And he spoke to them in parables. And the first parable is about a sower who went out to sow. The sower we're going to learn is Jesus Christ who came to sow the seed of truth to the whole world. So if you're in Matthew, uh, you can f thumb down through uh, chapter 13 and find the portion of the parable, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Somebody find the verse, you can let, let us all know. Verse 3? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so he said many things in parables. Verse 3, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seed fell on the good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has a hear, let him hear. So the seed is the word of God. And the sower is Jesus Christ. 
And the parable deals primarily where the seed lands, okay? On the hard path, on the stony areas, or in the, amongst the thorns, or on some good soil. And so the parable deals with the condition of the soil. And so by this parable, Christ was virtually saying to his hearers, it is not safe for you and I to stand as critics of his work or to indulge in disappointment because it does not meet your ideas. The question of greatest importance to you and me is this, how will you treat the words of Jesus? So there was four types of soil where the seed could fall. And only one of the four produced a harvest. It's kind of like new believers that are first hear the messages of, of Jesus in his words. Some sprang up real quickly, right? With joy. Hey, I found everlasting life through Jesus Christ as Lord. But then the cares of this life come along and they, or they, get, they get choked with the thorns, which are the cares of this life. And they lose their direction in the Christian walk. And so we're in one of those four situations. Our heart is in one of four conditions. We're gonna do, you do your own self-diagnosis, okay? Where are you in your heart soil today? Is it stony, hard? Is it preoccupied with the cares of this world that might choke out the spiritual journey you're on? Or is your heart conditioned and diagnosed such as that it is fertile soil for the seed, the word of God, and it takes root with conviction and you're willing to surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ? You're in one of the four categories. Let's look at the next parable. It's about sowing again. Um, a man who sows good seed in his field. Okay, that's found in uh, verse 24. And Jesus again says, the kingdom of heaven is like, or compared to, some versions would say. Compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. The servants said to the master of the house, came and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to the him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my bar barn. Again, a short story or a parable that illustrates the harvest at the end of the age or the end of the world. When the wheat and the tares, those who have chosen the world as their idol, as their God, they will be gathered by the angels and reserved for destruction. But the wheat symbolizes those that are true sons and daughters of God, they will be gathered and put into his harvest barn on a journey to heaven. The third parable is about a mustard seed. And in that parable, it was kind of brief, talks about the mustard seed being very small, but when it is uh, nourished, it grows into a very large tree, bigger than other plants, and it houses many birds of the air. Becomes a great, great tree. 
Then another short story, the heaven is like, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a leaven that a woman took and hid three measures of flour till it was all leavened. It's verse 30, uh, 33. Now, those of you that work in the kitchen, you know, work with uh, yeast, leveling of, leveling of various kinds, you know how it is important to work it into the entire batch of um, flour or whatever you're preparing. And uh, if you don't, then the, the dish isn't going to rise properly. And there's certain steps that you ladies know about, and uh, you do a fine job. So the, what's significant about the leaven in relationship to being the kingdom of heaven? You see, the word of God is going to spread around the entire globe. Every soul will have an opportunity to make a decision before the Lord comes. So like leaven, which is dispersed evenly, so is God's word spread around the globe. Jesus taught in parables, which was very common in the day. And the reason he did so is because Christ's view of truth was so broad that he, to extend his teaching, he used virtually every phase of nature and that was employed in il illustrating truth because the scenes that the eyes looked upon daily were connected with some spiritual truth. Nature was all about them. We tend to be closed into buildings a lot and we are missing a blessing when we're not outdoors. So Jesus spoke in parables that related to nature very, very much. In the early part of Jesus' ministry, he spoke rather plainly to people so that the people will have no misunderstandings about what he was saying. But to many of those hearers, the truth has not taken root in their hearts. And they have been, the truth had been taken from them through misleading teachings of the Pharisees. So Jesus began to speak in parables in the latter part of his ministry. And he said in uh, 13, chapter 13, 13 through 15, therefore I speak to them in parables because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Jesus had desired to awaken inquiry in the people's minds. Just like today, he seeks to arouse us from carelessness and impress truth upon the heart. And so there was no more effective way of teaching than teaching in parables. And that's why Jesus did this so much. In Jesus' teaching, just like today, he seeks an avenue to every heart. And so with the varied parables, eight of them, he was going to reach someone out there with at least one of those eight parables just like he's likely to reach your heart through one or more of those parables. In uh, Matthew 13, 44, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. See, in ancient times, it was customary for men to hide their treasures in the earth, similar to the story we heard at the beginning. Back in the day, thefts and robberies were rather frequent because people didn't have a safe storehouse for their wealth, their coins. And whenever there was a change in the ruling power, those who had large possessions, well, they were likely to be put under heavy taxation, 
And so they found the earth to be a safe haven for their treasures if they could find them at a later date. That's the part. Our minds often lose connection with events in the past. In addition, there was often a danger of invasion from marauding, marauding armies. And as a consequence, the rich endeavored to preserve their wealth by concealing it in the earth in a safe hiding place. But having forgotten it at times, or death claiming the owner, or imprisonment, or exile, these events would separate him from his treasure and his wealth. And so it would be left for the next land owner. And so the man's hired to cultivate the ground. As the oxen are plowing, the buried treasure comes to the surface. The man discovering it, he buries it again. The fortune is not too far out of his reach if he can just raise the sum of money necessary to purchase the land. So his friends and family think he's kind of crazy to sell what he has and raise as much cash to buy the field. The soil is nothing, nothing great, but the man knows what he is doing but no other human being sees the wisdom in what the man is doing by liquidating his assets to buy a piece of land. Isn't it that way sometimes with a heavenly treasure? Friends and family think you are not making a good decision to give your life to Christ because it requires some sacrifice, giving up the old pleasures of this world. But the man, once he has secured the property and then retrieves the treasure, the coin flips the other way. Now, all the human advice and wisdom say, yes, you did a good job, Mr. Treasure Hunter. So the parable illustrates the value of heavenly treasure and the effort that should be made to secure it. The finder of the treasure in the field was ready to part with all that he possessed. And he was ready to put forth untiring energy, labor, in order to secure the hidden riches. And so the heavenly searcher of treasure will count no labor too great, no sacrifice too dear, in order to gain the treasure's of truth. In the uh, parable, the field containing the treasure represents the Holy Scriptures, God's Word. The earth has veins of gold and silver and diamonds and precious metals, but there is not near as much wealth in the earth as there are between the covers of this book. You see, between the covers of this book is what we call the gospel. What's the meaning of the gospel? It means good story or good news. Or in another version, it means good telling. You see, it says in the parable, it appears that the treasures of the gospel are said to be hidden. But they're only hidden to those who don't search. You see, those who are wise by their own estimation, who are puffed up by the teaching of man's theories, vain philosophy, the beauty and the power and the mystery of the plan of salvation, they do not perceive. So Jesus said, many have eyes but do not see. They have ears but they do not hear. They have intellect but they do not discern the hidden treasure. And so 
human beings oftentimes walk over treasure that they don't know is beneath the earth. They don't have the right equipment to detect it beneath the soil. Might be at the foot of a tree. One might sit down and rest in the shade of a tree and be inches or just feet from a very valuable treasure and not even know it. And so it was with the Jews. There was a golden treasure. The treasure house, storehouse of truth in Jesus Christ was right there before them and they did not recognize it. The whole Jewish economy was pointing to Jesus Christ who was right in front of them day after day. God is not endeavoring to conceal his truth from any man or any woman, but it is by their own course of action that they make it obscure to themselves. Christ gave abundant evidence that he was the Messiah, but his teaching called for a decided change in their lives and that, they didn't, that road they did not wish to go down. We're told in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And from 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Matthew sixteen twenty six. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This morning, you and I are in one of four camps. Okay? Remember this parable of the sower? Okay? The road, stony, stony ground. No seed's going to grow there, right? Then there's the seed that falls by the wayside. Seed that's on soil with thorns that might choke out the life of a good seed. And then there's the seed that falls on the fertile soil. This morning, where is your heart? Is it in fertile, fertile soil? Have you found a treasure this week from the Lord by spending time in his word? These are where the real gems are right here. I pray that you will make it a decided decision this week to seek for that hidden treasure found in Jesus through his word.